Hello fellow bibliophiles and welcome back to Blatantly Bookish. I'm Marissa and today I would like to discuss the books that I read in the month of September. Yes, I know it is a bit belated, but here we are. September was a decent reading month for me. I read four books, I think five books actually each very different from each other, um, two of which I highly, highly recommend if you are interested in spooky, gothic, and just great autumnal fall reads. They would be perfect to read in October or November, um, but I just got a bit of a head start with the fall atmosphere in September, I suppose. So without further ado, on to the books. first book I finished in September was Things We Lost in the Fire by Mariana Enriquez. This is a series of short stories that I listened to on audiobook and they were utterly phenomenal. Mariana Enriquez is an Argentinian author and this, as far as I know, is her first collection of works that have been translated into English. These dark, gruesome short stories take place in the Argentinian slums, and they're just such a disturbing blend of Latin American mythology, folklore, and realism. There's everything in these stories from haunted houses and ghosts to serial killers and themes of poverty, child endangerment, and self-harm. Some of the horrors in these stories are part of a very real aftermath of a military dictatorship, and some are clearly supernatural. And then there are these brilliant characters who create a layer of ambiguity. As these characters mentally unravel, the reader has to navigate between reality and the supernatural. Many of these stories are rather open-ended and in a particularly beautiful and haunting way. Uh, but because I was listening to this as an audiobook while driving, I often didn't actually realize that one story had ended and another had begun. The stories seemed to blend into each other with a few notable exceptions. I think that because the endings were so beautifully subtle and that the themes and voice of the collection were so consistent that the audiobook really needed a little musical interlude or a long pause between stories or just something more distinct to separate them from each other. And because of this, I'd like to revisit these stories one day in print format because this collection was amazing and just perfect for this time of year. If you love dark, twisted stories like Shirley Jackson's work or Yoko Ogawa's short story collection Revenge, you will absolutely love this collection as well. If you've read Things We've Lost in the Fire before and for some reason haven't picked up, Shirley Jackson's The Lottery or Yoko Ogawa's Revenge, you absolutely should. They all have very similar tones and themes and are wonderfully spooky autumn reads. And speaking of autumn, another fantastic book to read in the fall months is Jamaica Inn by Daphne du Maurier. Even though I still think I like Rebecca better, this book blew me away. It's so atmospheric and is just this whirlwind of suspense and drama and historical intrigue. I was buddy reading it with Katie from Books and Things, but I ended up speeding ahead and devouring most of this book in one evening. Jamaica Inn is the story of Mary Yellen, who, following her mother's dying wish, goes to live with her aunt. Her aunt lives at Jamaica Inn on Bodmin Moor in Cornwall, and it's just this isolated inn in the middle of nowhere that hosts no guests because everyone is terrified to go there. And when Mary arrives, her aunt is different than Mary remembers. Her aunt lives in terror of the violent Uncle Joss and is as wasted away and desolate as Jamaica Inn itself. Mary suspects some illicit activities going on at the inn, and she's determined to discover the mysteries of Jamaica Inn for herself and save her aunt from her wretched fate there. Daphne du Maurier is such a talented writer, and clearly she is a huge fan of the Brontes. If you see Rebecca as a retelling of Jane Eyre, then this is Daphne du Maurier's version of Wuthering Heights. I just kept getting massive Wuthering Heights vibes while reading this book. Uncle Joss is described as having a creased black brow, skin the color of a gypsy. I actually pulled out my copy of Wuthering Heights while reading Jamaica Inn to compare the descriptions, and Uncle Joss may as well be named Heathcliff. 
and Daphne du Maurier is just such a master of suspense. She's so great at creating these characters who you're a bit wary and skeptical of, but you also sort of like. Just to clarify, I'm not talking about Uncle Joss anymore, he is despicable, but there's a different character who is a bit like Max and Rebecca and adds to the suspense of the plot of Jamaica Inn. Anyway, I loved how this book introduced me to a piece of dark history about the coast of Cornwall, and I spent quite a bit of time reading more about that historical aspect of the plot, which I always enjoy when a book really encourages me to do a little research. My major issue with this book, though, was the ending. There are two reasons I disliked the ending, and I'm having a hard time figuring out how to share my thoughts with you without spoiling the entirety of the book. I'll simply say that I thought that Mary deserved better, and that I shouldn't be able to predict a plot twist for the reason that I was able to. It was quite problematic, and I know that the book was written in the 30s, but I've read Victorian literature that is less problematic than this. And I know I'm being cryptic and vague, but that's what discussing a somewhat plot-driven book is about uh, when you're trying to avoid spoilers. Still, the ending of this book did not spoil my enjoyment of the book as a whole. Daphne du Maurier's writing is breathtaking, and the atmosphere she creates is worth picking up this book again and again. Just listen to this quote describing Jamaica Inn and tell me you guys don't want to read more. There was something strangely peaceful about the house, something very rare and difficult to define. It was like a house in an old tale, discovered by the hero one evening in midsummer. In the tale there would be strands of ivy clustering the walls and barring the entrance, and the house itself would have slept for a thousand years. I also read The Color Purple by Alice Walker this month, also as a buddy read with Katie. I first read this book in high school and it was a reread for me, but I am so glad that I reread it. It's such a powerful book and listening to it on audiobook in the author's own voice really added to the experience for me. The book is raw and devastating at times, dealing with themes of abuse, sexual assault, domestic violence, and general misogyny, but the book is also a testament to hope and focuses on themes of sisterhood, community, resilience, and bravery. The Color Purple follows Celie as she navigates the world as an African-American woman. Celie is separated from her sister Nettie when she's forced into marriage, and the book is a series of letters from Celie to her sister, who may not even be alive to receive them. These letters provide a space of Celie's own where she can exercise her own voice and ideas. The plot is interesting enough, and there's definitely a drive to keep reading and to learn more about Nettie, but it's the character progression and the development that makes this book worth reading. I've never read a book where the characters go through such emotional and realistic transformations. At its heart, this book is about learning to demand happiness for yourself. It's about love and redemption and the ability to learn and change as a person. This book is such a nuanced portrayal of the intersections between femininity and blackness, but it also has so much else to offer on masculinity, religion, colonialism, and a lot more. The Color Purple is just a phenomenal book on so many different levels and really should be required reading at this point. And on a much lighter note, I also reread The Secret Garden this month. The Secret Garden was one of my favorite books when I was younger. It's about Mary Lennox, a spoiled British girl from India who was orphaned and shipped back to England to live with her uncle. In both India and England, she is largely neglected by her parental figures, but through discovering a secret garden on her uncle's property and the power of nature, she's able to look outside herself, learn empathy, and open herself up to other people. This book is such a heartwarming and magical tale, just like I remembered. It's full of childhood wonder and curiosity, gorgeous descriptions of nature in the gardens and English moors, but in addition to my fond childhood memories of all the characters, on this read I was struck by the interesting portrayals of the differences between British and Indian culture, and Mary's experience of culture shock. And I was also particularly struck with the book's powerful portrayal of grief and loss. Without being sad or overly tragic, this book has a lot to offer about the process of grief and the best way to honor one's life and legacy. 
the book urges a powerful sense of warmth and openness and just captures this amazing sense of childhood and nostalgia for me. It's really quite a brilliant book and also one that I associate with Frances Hodgson Burnett's other work, A Little Princess, though I do think I prefer The Secret Garden. I also read The Grapes of Wrath this month, which unfortunately was a grave disappointment to me. I've read and fallen in love with a lot of Steinbeck's works, Of Mice and Men, East of Eden, and The Pearl. They're all books that have had major impacts on me, but The Grapes of Wrath was not one of those, and it's really giving me second thoughts about Steinbeck as an author, even though it's widely touted as his best work. The Grapes of Wrath is the story of the Joad family during the Dust Bowl in the 1930s as they migrate from Oklahoma to California in search of work and a better life for their family. The book alternates between chapters about the Joad family's experience and chapters that describe a more generic backdrop of the Dust Bowl and the time period as a whole. The Joad family is representative of countless others who decide to leave their failing family farms and make the trip to California in search of a better life. And I appreciated aspects of this book. It's a story about pursuing the American dream, about migration in a country full of immigrants, about prejudice and false promises, about the plight of the working class, and hope as long as workers remain united and people continue to care for one another. It's got a Christ figure in the character of the preacher, it questions morality and the prison system with the character of Tom Joad, and yet I didn't enjoy reading it. I didn't connect with any of the characters, they just felt too generic in their representations, and I found their dialogue to be unrealistic in its repetition and distracting in dialect. And I was rather disappointed with the plot arc and character arcs. When you think about it, not much actually happened in this book. The family traveled to California with constant warnings about how California was not the promised land they expected, yet they had to go witness it for themselves anyway. It was a self-fulfilling prophecy of a plot line, and plots like that are actually okay and even quite enjoyable when they are combined with beautifully complex and fleshed out dynamic characters, like in The Color Purple, for example. But I didn't feel like the characters in The Grapes of Wrath were nuanced enough individuals to carry along this type of plot. Because they were meant to represent the average migrant family, they came across as mostly generic figures to me. Perhaps Tom and the preacher were a bit more interesting, but even they were flat as boards compared to the intense characterization of other works, especially in contrast to The Color Purple, which I also read this month. The Grapes of Wrath definitely tried to take on a lot as a book. It worked to garner sympathy for migrant workers and challenge the unfair system of labor. It pushes for political and social change and is a successful critique of the system's corruption. It's vitally important for anyone seriously thinking about this historical time period and about migrant workers' lives. But apart from its political agenda as a story, a novel, and a piece of literature, I think it leaves a lot to be desired in execution. Perhaps something else that added to my dislike of this book was the history behind its inception, if you will. Steinbeck wrote this book after his publisher gave him a different author's notes on the subject matter. This other author, Sonora Babb, was born in Oklahoma, moved to California, and worked in the migrant camps. She kept notes about her experiences there and was in the process of writing her own novel when Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath achieved critical acclaim. Sonora Babb's work was shelved and not published until 2004, a year before she passed away. I haven't read it, and I had never even heard of it before looking up details about Steinbeck's literary life, but I can't help feeling that even though Steinbeck's work is meant to bring attention to the less privileged in society, it ironically, effectively silenced a female voice with firsthand and possibly therefore more nuanced experiences on the subject. So, yeah, those are my thoughts on The Grapes of Wrath and really all the books I read in the month of September. I hope you enjoyed this video. I would love to hear what you read in the month of September, even though that's a little far back at this point. Um, I'd love to hear about what you're currently reading, 
and if you've read any of these books, um, do you feel similarly to me? Do you feel differently? Um, I'd love to hear what you thought about any of these works in the comment section down below. Let's have a discussion. Until next time, I look forward to seeing you all in another video soon. Bye!